Some super cool examples, I tend to talk about data representation in three ways, just to position how I'm gonna talk about stuff. The first one, we just saw a great example, right? The classic business intelligence, trying to look at something that's happening, measure it, and improve it um, in some measurable kind of way. Uh, the second one, we saw examples earlier, um, spreading the message. So using infographics and tools like that to use data to tell a story, to either spread the word about somewhat, something or convince people to act or engage in some way. And then the third is the one that I do most, which is using data as a way to bring people together, um, as a way to engage people in some kind of community setting or decision-making processes. And that's the one I focus on most and the one I think I'm gonna talk about most. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I'm not gonna stand behind here because I'm short and I feel like that makes it hard for me to do things. Also, I like to walk around a lot and wave my hands. So I will be doing that. Um, so I called this uh, talk Questioning Our Data Culture, and I think that's important. We've heard that word a couple of times. Thinking about what uh, the set of practices and the way we operate around something is. Um, so I do this work at Northeastern University. Um, I like to start with just a land acknowledgement of that Northeastern University is built on the traditional land of both the Wampanoag and the Massachusetts people. Um, Somerville, the city I live in, is one of 12 cities in uh, the Massachusetts area that have changed the Columbus Day to call it uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. I think that's one way of honoring that heritage. I also have learned a ton from being involved in a project called the Data Against Feminicides Project, where I can work with groups of indigenous people that are tracking missing, murdered, and indigenous women, so MMIW. Um, so those are two ways that I think we're trying to honor that heritage, both individually and also in the community setting. So I want to start by taking you on a little journey with me, just to set a scene. Um, so if you'll flow with me for a minute, close your eyes, and I want you to imagine a uh, Middle Eastern market. So you might hear the sounds of, in my case, this is actually a picture from India, um, because those are the markets I know better. You might hear the sound of a bicycle going by. You will probably be hearing some animals, either in India it'll be some cows or some dogs. Middle East it might be more goats um, walking around. You'll hear trade happening, people exchanging goods, lots of vendors trying to get your attention, um, car horns honking, uh, motorcycle horns honking, uh, rickshaw horns honking. Um, so, Imagine that setting, and then imagine a young man named Asim. Asim is, has just woke up, and Asim is running late for work. So Asim lives on one side of the market, work, the factory is on the other side of the market. Asim is running through this market, trying to get to work. But before he could do that, he is taking care of his mother. His mother is sick. He has to, uh, there's a medicine schedule of things that she needs. He has to put a cold compress on her head, um, and uh, Asim, is heading out the door, he passes some instructions to his sister, walks into this market, runs around those bicycles, around those animals, around that trade, and makes his way to the factory. The factory, as you might if you've worked in the service industry, there's someone clocking him in. So there's a dude with a tablet who's like looking at his name and be like, you're late. If you're late one more time, you're gonna be fired. Anyone that's worked in service industry or in factory type settings, you've experienced that before. Um, so why do I share this story? Uh, it's relatable. It's an example of data production, right? This is collecting data about people showing up late to work. You can open your eyes now if you would close them. Um, it sounds very contemporary, but it's actually about 3,000 years old. Um, why do we know this? We know this because there is a piece of clay that has scratched in it the reasons that people were late to work. So this is the history of data production, is like bureaucracies <laughs> keeping track. And this is called an ostracon. It's in the British Museum because that's where things that the British stole from the Middle East go. They go to the museum until we can convince them to give it back. Um, and this one holds tons of records about why people were late to work. Incredibly mundane. So uh, this is, I think it's, if I remember right, it's from the Kingdom of Ur. I might have that wrong. Um, I'm not seeing the notes on there. Um, but it's about 3,000 years old. Uh, why were people late? Uh, well, someone was wrapping the, mother of their cor uh, the corpse of their mother, so they were embalming them. Um, another one was, like Asim, taking care of his sick mother. So people have been late for work for a while. Data has been produced about that to track it and use it punitively against them for a long time. Why is that important? 
It's a culture of surveillance, right? One of the historical cultures of data is that it's used for surveillance. So when I or you other consultants in the room go into a company and talk about engaging and using data, there's a barrier there because very often that data is used to assess someone's performance and then decide whether to fire them or to give them a promotion. That's a barrier and it's one of the cultures of data that we have to acknowledge and you know, has a very, very long history. There we go, second example I wanna give. So one culture of the existing dominance is surveillance. A second one I wanna talk about and tell a short story of a community meeting that I went to about, it's about 15 years ago. I live in a town that's very dense, about 80,000 people, and they do these things that, if you're in the US, you're probably familiar with hearing about these. They do like evening meetings where they talk about how the city is going and they do Q&A. Usually it's a, a person like that standing in front of a projector, um, trying to convey authority about the, the civic planning that's happening. And I was in one of these meetings, and. You know, at the time, I had been working on data visualization, um, so I was familiar with the data that they were showing. They were talking about things like recycling rates improving after starting to do single stream recycling. Um, they were showing a chart about school improvement. And the chart looked like this. You've all probably already seen the gap minder, right? There's like five or six different encodings. It's animated over time. I was sitting in front of this chart, and I was like, what the hell is that showing? I could not figure it out and they were trying to narrate it. But then I looked around the room, right? This is a civic meeting in the evening, and no, everyone had confused look on their face. The level of visual literacy it takes to understand something like this is incredibly high. Even in the US where you can assume that in general, like third grade is introduced to things like bar charts, visual literacy is, is, is part of a standard curriculum across the US, uh, and data literacy in a variety of ways is built into math mathematic and other curricular outcomes. Nobody could understand this chart. The encodings were confusing, it was actually doing a differential, so it was talking about a rate of change. They were missing the mark on meeting people where they were. The audience wasn't ready to take a visual like this. It speaks to a second culture of, our, of the way we work with data, a culture of formalism. So I'm trying to take a step back from all these examples we've seen and introduce some of the ideas underneath them that we want to think about and acknowledge. So the first is this culture of surveillance that is historically how data has been operated. Um, a second is we have a culture of formalism. Right? There is a culture where the rhetorical power of data, the reason it is convincing is because it uses the visual forms of science and truth-seeking. And that's a very powerful tool for us to acknowledge. Why is that? It's because it originated in these fields of the sciences, statistics, and business. So there's a set of fields where the ways we work with data and show it emerge from these fields. Right? And we can go into the history of it, but, um, but uh, that's the summary of the domain. Yet now, through datification and all these other spread of data for a variety of reasons, there's these new settings, right? These newspapers, these museums, these libraries, community groups, government settings. These are all the new places where people are being brought together around data, right? Not being used to analyze something or necessarily to spread the message about something. The people are being brought together. And these are very different lists. More importantly, the goals are different. In the sciences, pursuit of truth, evidence gathering, we're, there's a specific set of goals that informed the creation of all the charts we use today. In these new settings, this is totally different. Participation, engagement, empowerment, efficacy, the belief that you can make change, these are two very different lists. Yet we've taken this whole box full of media, right? The charts and graphs, the like putting things in a spreadsheet, filling out surveys, and we've brought them over here. My argument is, is that has caused problems. That has led to many of the harms and the barriers for bringing people together around data that we're experiencing now. It's because of this problem, this gap. Now, uh, I can formalize that more. These are the sort of main cultures, I think, that inform that in the original domains of data use, where it originated. Formalism, authority, surveillance, and capitalism are the main things that are we seeing as the cultures of data use right now, right? Um, and these are fine when you're in those settings, like 
if you're in a business thing trying to improve some, some, some metric that you can easily measure, then those might be the cultures that you want to engage. Um, but if you're in one of these other settings, there's a problem. Um, so the dominant cultures don't fit what I call the pro-social settings, where those aren't the dominant goals. Right? It's a very different language. This is a problem, and it's a problem of this shift where you can call it datification or whatever you want. It's the problem of data spread. And that presents opportunities. And it presents this issue where our toolbox doesn't match anymore. So I think we should blow up in that toolbox because of this shift. And it's a really important issue because, and just this puts it very starkly, right? If you're trying to do the thing on the right-hand side, you might accidentally use tools for the left. Right? If you're trying to empower people, you might be using tools that actively disengage them. If you want people to ask questions in a community meeting like the one I went to in my hometown, then you probably don't want to have a PowerPoint with a chart because that conveys authority. It reduces their ability to ask questions. That's very different. So I want to give you a little bit of introduction why, but this isn't a new way of thinking about things. Um, Eduardo Galeano is a journalist and author from Uruguay. He wrote about this really well in uh, the book of Embraces. His quote, in Central America, the more wretched and desperate the people, the more the statistics smiled and laughed. We've heard some people talk about the dehumanization or the separation that numbers and data can cause. And we have to be concerned about that because it can lead to things like what Galeano is talking about. So how can you work on this? I want to give you two or three examples. The first is build data sculptures. We've already seen wonderful examples of alternate media that work differently. So uh, I've been working on this, and uh, there's a piece that we submitted and got shortlisted, I think, last year at IIB. Um, during COVID, this piece worked on food security. It's one example. Um, during COVID, this is a chart from the Department of, Tr of uh, Transitional Assistance, uh, Massachusetts uh, agency that helps with food assistance. So during the pandemic, access to food greatly reduced, a whole bunch of new people coming into needing food. So you all read this chart, you see that giant spike and you're probably being pulled back to March 2020 when everything shut down. And the need for food, the number of people that were applying for SNAP benefits, so for applying for food assistance, so you would get a card, you could spend money on food, soared. It dropped again as the government stepped in and gave more assistance, and then it bumped again when that, that ran out. This is a really important issue to my, me and my family. It's when we work on a lot in different ways in our community and regionally. And we wanted to do something about this. We wanted to activate this data and engage people. This might engage people in this room, <laughs> but this chart does not engage people outside of this room. It doesn't speak to them in a way that meets people where they are in their understanding of things. So, the actual number is, on average during that time, there were 1,659 new households applying for SNAP benefits every day. So in Massachusetts, 1,659 households were saying, we need help with money for food. It's a shocking, staggering number. So we decided to do something different. We made a data sculpture. So we spent a few months collecting 1,659 pieces of cutlery, and we welded it into a table. Um, well, specifically, my wife welded into a table. I am not the welder in the family. The pieces that fell off in the first week, those are the ones I welded. <laughs> the fact that it stayed together is all her welding. Um, so we worked on this together, and we created this table. It's a full-size table, weighs about 150 pounds. I know that because we carry it everywhere in our trunk to move it from site to site. Um, and it operates in a very different language. So we had it at places like farmer's markets. We had it at places like um, where people would come up and say, wait, what is that? And we'd say, oh, well, this is, you know, it's a table that talks about this, this problem. It's made of this many colors. We'd be like, oh, cool, what is that? Oh, can I sign up? And then we would send them over to the table that they otherwise never would know about where they could do signups. So as a doorway into accessing the thing it's about. Second, we had it in art galleries in affluent neighborhoods where people say, oh, food security isn't a problem in our neighborhood. Well, actually, yes, it is. It is almost everywhere in the US, specifically in Massachusetts. Um, so we'd say, oh, great. Here's a list of resources and on a website. So there was a short video that played. We had some qualitative stories from people that were engaged in that system. So we would push people into understanding how they could be activated. It was a doorway into the data, um, a new door. Um, 
And we had it at other places like town halls, we had it at, um, uh, at the a giant like Walk for Hunger that happens in Massachusetts, so big civic events, um, to trying to engage people into an issue they otherwise might not engage with through the power, as some people mentioned earlier, the visual language of the arts and the fact that you could, you could feel this, right? You could sit down next to it. And it spoke to people just in a different way. Um, even more powerfully, an example from Chicago, during the wave of protests in the summer about the amount of police funding that was happening. So defund the police was arguing that money could be spent in other ways more effectively in social services. This group, Black Youth Project, was advocating around that, and they built this cardboard bar chart, right? So a very similar, um, uh, a standard chart form made out of cardboard on the street. So it speaks in a real spectacle, like you're, I'm down here looking at it, right? That's about life size. So I'm down here looking at the size of this. I'm like, oh wow, look, this bar here, this is the police funding in Chicago. There's someone from Chicago here. Like that's the amount of money, police. This is schools, and then we get start to get to other social services. They were arguing this was a problem. And like, this is, it's cool, I like it, it's on the street, it's meeting people where, it are, where they are. Here's why it actually is really interesting to me. This is made out of cardboard boxes. You can grab a cardboard box and you can move it, right? A bar chart doesn't look changeable. It speaks of static truth. This cardboard bar chart, you can grab something and move it. It makes you think as a viewer that change is possible, which is what their point is, right? So as whether you agree on that changing of, of, of funding or not, what their method does using a different media, going outside the standard toolbox, just using cardboard boxes, changes how you read it and what the viewer thinks is possible. And that to me is a really powerful example of just changing one variable of how they encoded it, right? The media, right? Not using a bar, using a box and a stack of boxes suddenly changes how you think about it. It makes you think, hey, this is actually something we can change. And that was their message. And that to me is a really powerful example. So, uh, long history, you all can look at that. Somebody mentioned the, uh, the data physicalization. I call these sculptures because I think physicalization A is super hard to say, I totally agree. B, I think it includes both embodiment and externalization, which is like sculptures. So I, I tend to focus on sculptures because embodiment we'll get to later. So it's a culture of empowerment that we need to embrace in these new settings, right? We're no longer in the sciences. We're on the street protesting about budgets. We need a different toolbox. That's a culture of empowerment. Second example, um, that says paint data murals. <laughs> so uh, participatory community murals uh, are you know, rich history from specifically South America and Mexico have long traditions of using painting arts on the wall to affect public conversation and public perception. The, so long, we have a long history of studying that, talking about how it shifts public uh, public debate and how it can shift policy, tons of research on impacting that. So we've been doing data murals for about, yeah, more than 10 years. Again, another project with my wife, who's my main collaborator on this stuff. Um, what does that mean? Well, we start with something like a data handout, um, something that you all would find familiar. Um, we move to finding a story together with that data, with a community. Once we have that story, we start to do some facilitated visual design where we collectively design a mural to paint. We get a bunch of people together and we paint it. And then we have an opening ceremony because those are fun. Everybody likes snacks, everybody likes opening ceremonies. This process changes the ownership of the data story. Usually data like this would be, so this is specifically about the impact of a urban farm. And the story they're telling uh, starts over on the left-hand side about the health problems that are happening in the community. They've reclaimed this many plots in like an old parking lot to plant vegetables. And then they're taking that in mobile markets. It's very infographic-y. In mobile markets to uh, youth saying that I never knew vegetables could taste good, raw vegetables, um, to 400 kids at schools helping, to all of that formula together equals together living better. So it's a story where they analyze the data that had been produced about them, that had been extracted from them, and they owned the story that they were telling with it. Right? It wasn't shipped off to somebody else to analyze and send back a report. That flips the power narrative. 
that rhetorical power of using information, it flips it. So yes, there's an, like a theory under there, but very concretely, it changes it up. This, we did the same thing in Brazil a year later. Um, we've been doing these. There's 12 of them we've helped with around the world. And then there are, there's a big group around um, Kenya and Tanzania that is doing a bunch of data murals inspired by this work. Um, and then there's some other examples also that are sort of starting to pop up, which we're super excited about. Um, so this is powerful for me because it treats data as a mirror. Usually I would argue Data is a window. We look at some other group by capturing data about them and producing it, and then analyzing it. So we're looking at some other people. Mirror is very different. This is the community reflecting back to itself. That's a mirror. And that is a very different way to use data. So I think that this builds a cultural participation when you're building mirrors instead of windows. Um, and that's a very, again, a different need. We're not scientists doing observation here. We're trying to help a group use information to advocate for change or showcase their impact or things like that. Okay, the last one is performing data theater. So this is where I was splitting between uh, embodiment and, um, and sculpture. So there is a, we're doing a bunch of experiments now with a bunch of colleagues of mine at Northeastern University where I work in the theater department because I wasn't the theater kid in high school. So I'm learning from all of my colleagues that work in theater. And what I'm learning is, first of all, Tableau means something totally different to them. So if you talk to some theater people, Tableau doesn't mean what we mean Tableau means, okay? Um, second of all, there's a real richness. This is some students performing a piece where we're working with a group that works on the issue of green space in the city. And as you know, most cities that are very urban, it's hard to fight for green space, specifically in areas that are typically underfunded. Um, what happens though is that when you build that green space, very often those groups that used to live there are displaced. In Boston and many other cities, it's people of color that live in those city, place, parts of the city and they are, that, they are gentrified out as soon as green space comes in. This is really problematic. Um, so that's a tension. So you could get into that tension with, you know, like I mentioned, a PowerPoint presentation and a Q&A afterwards and a civic meeting in the evening, but that only reaches certain people. There's only certain people that can come to that in the evening. Any parents in the room will understand how hard that is to do. So we're trying something different. We're saying, can we actually create a theatrical representation of that data? That means like a half an hour production and then has deliberation afterwards. There are practices within the history of participatory theater that we can learn from. Again, learning from the arts. So theater of the press performance, this is from Rio de Janeiro. Augusto Baul is a very famous theatrical pioneer that created a whole bunch of ways to talk about building civic literacy through theater. He builds on pedagogy and like ways of thinking about knowledge from Freire, a Brazilian philosopher and educator. So there's a tradition, is my argument, the, the tradition of theater impacting society. So we're trying some things there. We're starting to see initially, first off, the rehumanization piece is, ve is there. And that you'd hypothesize that trying to represent people in theatrical form um, very much re-enlivens the data and puts the people back into it. Um, a second is that the dramaturg, the people that put on th the performance, are very critical of the source data right away, which is super cool. Um, they, don't, they are at constantly asking questions about it, which takes much longer in other settings that I work in. So there's some interesting findings that we're already writing about and uh, we're trying out in more civic settings. Uh, the last example is from the LAPD. It's not the Los Angeles Police Department, the Los Angeles Poverty Department. So if you know Los Angeles, Skid Row is an area of town that has been constantly, uh, it has a huge unhoused population that fights and advocates for the community they've built there and the zoning so that they can stay in that community and have housing. It's constantly under pressure from development from various parts. The LAPD is one of the groups that pushes back and helps that group and is made up of that group. They made data mini golf, which to me is like, yes, I love mini golf. It's so wonderful. And they wanted to talk about how to protect their community from the latest zoning changes. So they created this course where each of the holes represents different parts of their community 
and different data sets about the zoning changes that would happen. Um, the, this one is very readable, very legible. It's a line chart where there's a hole in the tube and you have to go and pick which ball you're gonna send it down. So you're playing the data visualization. The last hole, which I think is up there on the top right, is really, is really powerful because you see that, that little arrow? You have to get your ball into the final hole, right? And then your ball disappears. That hole is a map of Los Angeles and it has the rezoned area. So when you try to get it in, you realize very quickly the ball doesn't fit into the hole. So you can't actually win that hole. So they're making an argument. They're saying this space is too small. Just like the ball can't go into the hole, we can't fit here anymore, right? And then they did a performance. This is like, I talk about this for an hour, but they did a performance. They have a theatrical performance where they talk about how these deals are made on the golf course, right? So they're making fun of the way politicians um, actually advocate and try to pass these, legis these legislations. And after they first performed this, I mean, it started to get huge. People were coming to visit. It was a great invitation in. It opened a new door. You know, the people that originally zoned, proposed this zoning, like more than half of those city councilors are now in prison. So it was a totally corrupt system. And they were highlighting it in a very amusing, tongue-in-cheek way. You can kind of get away with it. Um, so this just talks about like a participatory and performative way to connect to data, a very different way of knowing and learning and opening a new door. So uh, this culture of performance, I think, is another one that we want to focus on as we think about this difference between where data came from and where it is now. So uh, these are some of the cultures. I think I put participation twice. It's that important, but I think I probably meant to put empowerment there. Um, this is a different list. Um, and this is a list that I tend to focus on and I think matters in a lot of our work and suggests that that little toolbox that we're using we need to blow it up and connect it to the goals and the context of where we're working with data and how we're bringing people together. Right? Those are things that computers don't help you with. They don't help you figure out, like, what's the goal of this? Why, are people going to be tired when I'm talking about this? Are people, do they have high literacy, visual literacy? Do they know how to read a bar chart? Do they actually think about this in numbers? Computers don't help you with that at all. So we got to figure out other mechanisms. As you can see, I borrow from the arts in those settings. I call this approach popular data, um, inspired by that, that Brazilian educator that I mentioned earlier. Um, the idea that we want it to be accessible in more ways. I'm an academic in many ways, even though I do practice and do data visualization. So of course, it's a framework with some principles. <laughs> this is my, I'm an academic, it's a framework with some principles slide. Uh, these are all, uh, tips and guidelines about how to think about things. So um, impact being a crucial piece, participation being a design goal, um, that thing I mentioned about mirrors versus windows as a way to think about it. The idea that we should start simple to lead people into complex stories. You don't need to shy away from complexity, but you gotta, you gotta pull them in. Otherwise they get scared off by like a very busy, Tuftian kind of data density approach to things. Um, we got to open many doors to different types of people. I'm not saying we shouldn't do trainings on spreadsheets and things like that, but we're missing a whole group of people that are not going to be engaged by that. Um, and then we got to meet people where they are. That cardboard chart on the street is an example of that. Go to the context where people are and the ways they're thinking about something and how they understand it. So I do all that work at the Data Culture Group, which is my little research group at Northeastern. Um, and uh, when I do it, it kind of looks more like this. this is, these are some photos. I think all of these are from the UN Data Forum, where, which is like a super, no offense, but like super stodgy, like we're wearing suits and we're thanking the honorable gentleman and the honorable madam and things like that. And then I showed up and did a thing where people were writing on the walls and doing data sculptures with craft materials and like got them to loosen up a little bit and talk about how they're engaging people on development data. If it's not something we need to engage, I don't know what we can engage people on that's more important than development data, right? We have to meet people where they are. Um, so it looks more like this, which is very different than the spreadsheet trainings that I sometimes teach as well. This is coming out in a book sometime next year that's tentatively called Community Data. So if you like this sort of stuff, keep an eye out for it. Um, uh, a lot of examples like this that try to give us a bigger set of inspirations to say like, yes, this stuff counts. All these arts examples, I love this. This stuff counts as working with data. And it's what we need some more of in a time where data has spread to those new contexts. So you can find me online if you want to chat some more about this stuff. I'll be around this afternoon too. I don't know what my time was like. Hopefully it was, that was okay. All right, great. Thank you so much. I'll hand it over to Amanda.